just one more class until lunch. I'm starting to become dazed. Winter? Waverly. You've got environments next. I do? Looks like we have that together. Cool. Do you want to sit together? She pauses at my offer. I guess that's fine. I think I'm going to stop trying with her soon. I take a seat near the center of the classroom, and Waverly takes the place to my right. Shortly after we're situated, the instructor arrives. Hello, children. What a young teacher. Casey McLaughlin, environments instructor. There is also a lab class on due days and quad days. I'm your teacher for that as well. Two and four. Have any of you taken an environmental study class before? I'm pretty sure that's mandatory for all schools, Mr. McLaughlin. Right, it's uh, been a while since I was in school. I hear someone say it's three years a while, and I can't help but chuckle. Well, this class will be pretty strange for you guys. My objective is to make sure you're acclimated to the random nature of other worlds... well, nature. Every world's environment is somewhat different, after all. I won't just be focusing on environments themselves, though. I'll also be focusing on the things which live in those environments. The plants, the animals... oh, and the people. Have you had social studies yet? Myself and some others raise our hands. Then you were probably with Hayden. Did she mention the fundamental differences between us humans and those sentiment, those sentients of other planes? How they are prone to conflict. I've got to imagine she did. I suppose she did in a way. Those differences are, in a way, biological. Chaos can stick around the body and lead to disorganized and destructive thinking. Oh yeah, on that note, I should mention that we tend to refer to those of other worlds with the term people rather than humans. Here we go. Although the term people is defined as human beings in general, for most of society, the word has a more exact meaning in the context of mediation. For mediators, people is a blanket word for all intelligent life found on our own plane as well as others. This is in contrast with the word humans, which refers only to earthen. This distinction exists in order to emphasize that although many other worldlers may appear earthen, their behavior distinguishes them to such an extent that they should not be considered as such. There is some controversy regarding this idea. The main point of debate is whether otherworlders are simply humans who behave as they do to a high exposure to chaos, or whether they are truly a separate species that only appear to be human. Like most things, the truth is likely to be somewhere in between. It is important to note that although we do not consider otherworlders to be human and therefore do not extend to them our human rights, a mediator is expected to behave as though all otherworlders are human, unless the situation requires otherwise. Any act performed on an otherworlder which may which would have violated another human's rights on Earth must be reported and justified. Unjustifiable acts may be punished. Hmm. Oh yeah. Oh, wait, we said that one already. For one thing, many find it distasteful to call us by the same name. But this isn't a debate class, so we won't be going into that. Secondly, not everyone from other worlds is even a human equivalent. There are infinite kinds of thinking animals, so just try to keep that terminology in mind going ahead. Anyway, let's talk about pollution and its effect on us. Many other worlds have a problem with pollution. We quickly nip some tissues in the bud on Earth, so we're not used to polluted air or water at all. The people of other worlds, however, largely grow accustomed. When we go to such worlds, it's paramount to take note of the, to the, to take note of the difference in the environment and the atmosphere and such, and to take care not to invite illness onto yourselves. Always make sure you check your codex to see if there are any foods which are poisonous to us there. And mind that you don't freely eat or imbibe anything offered to you until you're certain it's safe. We're an incredibly healthy people, but sadly that also makes us very susceptible. So if you're wanting to blend in with whatever society you've gone to and your body is betraying your legitimacy, don't panic. A few good go-to ex excuses are that you aren't feeling well at the moment, you're allergic, or whatever you've been given to drink or eat is bad. That last one can get you into trouble, depending on where you are, though. Pollution is a very easy problem to fix. The people of other worlds must be total imbeciles. Whether it's good for our own planet or not, it's a good thing we are going out to teach them right from wrong. Apparently, they can't figure it out themselves. Lunchtime, finally. Hey, want to get lunch together? No, thanks. I'm just going to get something quick and then head to the library. See you. Okay, then. Winter Harrison. Oh, hey, Irie. Madeline not with you? 
Nah, we had different classes before lunch, so we agreed to meet in the cafeteria after. Wanna eat with us? I kind of don't, given Iria's past behavior, but maybe she'll ease up on that the more we get to know each other. I shrug. Yeah, sure, why not? Suddenly, Iria's attention is diverted from me. Oh, hey, it's that shitty-looking guy from before! My name is Tybalt, not shitty-looking guy. I assume that you are aware of how loudly you are saying this. Of course! I never say anything I don't want to be heard! So hey, what's the deal with the rough look anyway? It's creepy. I can't believe the things that are coming out of this girl's mouth. I hope I don't get in trouble for her attitude by association. Creepy. Listen, you little twerp, you think I want to go around looking like this? I'm on call for an ongoing mediation, and this is what I have to wear to fit in on that world. Whoa, calm down there, sunshine. Jeez, never thought a mature adult would get so riled up by a couple of teenagers. Oh no, don't bring me into this. I have nothing to do with this. This man is scary. Tybalt's eyes drift over to me, and his voice changes after seeing my expression. Uh... Sorry for losing my temper, kid. Between managing the tech on campus and this damn mediation, I haven't been sleeping much lately. He rubs his eyes. No, we're sorry. We're sorry, right, Ira? I look to her with pleading eyes. She sighs. Yeah, I guess. I quickly start talking to keep Iria from worsening the situation. So, you manage technology and mediate? Isn't that a lot for one person? It is, but we're short staff right now, so everyone has to pull their weight. And nobody knows the tech around here better than me. If you're the best at tech, then how come you're not teaching it, huh? Iria, please shut up. Thankfully, he seems more amused at the question than offended. Do I seem like good teacher material to you? Good point. Is being short-staffed common? Oh yeah. I don't think I can remember a time when we had enough people. Shouldn't the school be accepting more students or something then? Well, it's not as simple as just accepting more people. Not everyone is cut out to be a mediator. But anyway, I can't be talking to you kids. This is one of the few breaks I get, and I want to make use of it. Oh, yeah, sure. Sorry again. It's not a problem, really. Try to teach your friend some manners, though. She can't be running her mouth like that when she starts mediating. I chuckle nervously while Irie glares daggers. I pull her away before she can mouth off any more. Surprisingly, she allows it. When we arrive at the cafeteria and meet Madeline, Irie spends the whole lunch hour railing against that loser Tybalt. The girl sure holds a grudge. Next up is technology with Hayden again. Thankfully, Irie is not in this class. Hey guys, how was lunch? The class provides many satisfied responses. Good, good. I don't really eat at the cafeteria or anything these days. I prepare my food at home and bring it to school. So the, food's he the, so the food here is still pretty alright, huh? Again, we agree. Mistress Hayden, where do you live? Down in Blacksburg? There is a couple apartment buildings not too far from campus. Most of us live there. Hayden yawns. Anyway, this is your technology class, and today we'll be discussing one kind of technology and in the, in the implications of its existence. Please look at your ICDs. I do so and see Hayden in my periphery doing the same. Suddenly a codex entry pops up. It's one for firearms. This is a firearm, colloquially <laughs> known as a gun. Guns are very common weapons in other systems, but we don't have them here. Tell that to Cyrus. We, start, we stopped developing weapons in the year 3333, shortly before the establishment of the world government. These days, weapons are collector's items, tools for hunting, or reproduced in a safe form to be used in sports like fencing or bludgeon. Thus, we never made it to guns. I'm going to guess that's a good thing. Guns are very deadly and vicious. Yep. They work like easy to use, incredibly high speed bows and arrows. When the trigger is pulled, it shoots a bullet from the barrel. When the bullet hits the target, it tears through. It can kill most people instantly if it goes through the head. Sometimes the firepower of the gun is too weak and the bullet gets stuck in the target's body. This leads to a very painful experience and a likely infection. Guns are among the most useful and horrifying weapons developed on other planes. They tend to be extremely prevalent and extremely dangerous. They can be tools of protection, but they're mainly tools for murder. 
Who here knows what murder is? I'm rather too stunned to respond, as is most of the class. After a few seconds, somebody answers. It's when an animal kills another animal for no reason. Wrong, Mr... Barry Horton. Wrong in a general sense, but right by Earth's meaning. Get familiar with that word not being animal exclusive or related to animals at all. Unless you choose to think of the people of other worlds as animals. <laughs> According to our history, we've only ever killed one another within reason, and not very much. It was exclusive to wars during which we tried to avoid killing as much as possible. It should be said that a person of another world is likely to say that any killing of another person, whether within or without reason, is a murder. Regardless, people of other planes murder each other a lot. I'm telling you this now because it is the hardest part of mediation for most to understand, at first. Next to magic, which is just bullshit. Magic is a force present on some worlds, which allows the physical properties of the world and its matter to be manipulated unconventionally. Despite being present in many worlds, the existence of magic is controversial among Earth mediators. There are many theories which attempt to unify magical universes with our conventional ideas of physics. One such idea is that these worlds exist within a simulation of some kind, and that the computer running the simulation obeys conventional physics, while allowing the physical laws to be broken inside the simulation. So that's Star Ocean in a nutshell. Telos Kokonos, one of the first mediators, was, found, was known to be fond of magical universes and once quipped, how typical us to view such beauty and fantasy and declare it fake. If we could but establish order, these worlds would be a paradise far greater than our own. Due to the massive variety in types of magic and methods of use, these topics will not be discussed in this entry. Please refer to the enter entries for specific magical plans for more information. You shouldn't be shadowing on any mediations involving murder for a decent while, but it's hard to avoid. At the very least, mediation of wars is completely beyond your current grasp. Murder is something you have to start to understand now. There are many reasons people kill other people. It could be in a fit of passion, it could be under orders, it could be for the best. It could be for the hell of it. Uh, by that I mean for no reason at all. It can be complicated or very simple, and often the murderer can become incredibly shaken up by taking another's life. I... I'm not here to tell you how you should feel about murder. I am not going to tell you to admonish it or to sympathize with those that do it. I'm here to tell you that you have to get used to it, and hopefully get you used to it before it happens and you're traumatized. In other words, murder is very plain and regular. That's absolutely terrifying. What exactly have I gotten myself into? I'm starting to become concerned that I'm in the wrong profession. I enter my last class of the day, Chaotic Forces with a somber air. Some of my peers seem to share this feeling. Hello again, everyone. How has your day been? For once, reaction is mixed, likely because not everyone here had technology before this. I see, I see. Well, I think it's about time to start unraveling the mystery of chaos, don't you? Chaos is a rather nebulous concept. It technically does not exist per se, but rather it is the likelihood of ordered states to fluctuate in a system or plane. It should be said that this fluctuation can produce positive results, one example of which being evolution. The small changes from the fluctuation of genetic code during reproduction can result in an improved organism. However, to continue with the same example, fluctuation in genetic code can also create less functional organisms and diseases like cancer. In fact, it is more likely to cause a negative or neutral result than a positive one. It should therefore be easy to see why too much chaos can be harmful to a system. As is the case with most things in life, moderation is key. Let's talk about Earth or System Zero for a bit. Our plane is an exception that, so far as we know, has no equivalent in existence. Our world absorbs chaos and reduces it, rather than producing and emitting it as most do. Because of this, some theorize that we are the chaotic equivalent of a black hole, while other worlds are stars. Because evolution requires chaos, it can be said that all life requires a little chaos to exist. So if we do not produce it, then how do we exist? The answer is that chaos bleeds over from neighboring planets which are emitting chaos, and this is a good thing as long as we don't receive too much. In the early years of our existence, we received very little, and so our world was naturally predisposed to order. Because of this, we are the only perfectly functioning utopia existence has ever seen. However, in 48, 50, over a millennium and a half after the establishment of the world government, we finally took notice of chaotic energies. There was a major chaotic event in a nearby plane, and the resulting rise in chaos caused many disasters and tragedies in our world, which I will not get into here. 
Ironically, the higher levels of chaos also accelerate our rate of technological advancement. The discovery of chaos, the invention of the transplanter engine, the ICD, and many other breakthroughs occurred during that time. Over the next 200 years, we researched and came to a greater understanding of chaos. When the first meteors brought the other planes nearer to order, the chaos in our plane reduced, and so too did the disasters. It is no exaggeration to say that without mediation, our world would break apart and fall to absolute ruin. New planes rise and fall every hour, every second. Races come and go. Wars begin and planets die. It all contributes to chaos, and as we are the nexus of all worlds, it all comes back down to us. That is why it is our job, our duty to prevent and reduce the occurrence of chaotic events on nearby planes. It is what keeps our world stable and safe. Wow. This is kind of heavy stuff. My first day of classes is complete. I allow myself to fall into bed. I deserve it, I think. I don't know why, but classes always make me sleepy. Maybe it's the lack of movement. In any case, I decide to take a quick nap before supper. I snuggle into my bed and quickly fall asleep. When I wake up, I regret my decision to nap. I feel kind of gross now. I should have just gone for a walk or something instead to wake myself up. I roll over and look at the ceiling. I should explore the campus a bit after I eat, I think. Waverly mentioned an ICD instruction manual in the library. Maybe that would be worth checking out. At the very least, visiting the library in general sounds like a good idea, so let's do that. For a change, there's nobody I know at the cafeteria, so I eat my spaghetti alone in peace, which is actually kind of nice. I've probably gained more social interactions these past few days than I have in weeks, and it's starting to wear on me a little. But enough of that. Onward to the library! Wow, this place looks pretty cozy. A little bit dark for my taste, though. Seems like it might be an easy place to accidentally fall asleep in. And my record for unintentional naps is not good as is. I moved to check out the sectional map of the library and discovered that, contrary to my expectations, most of the library is dedicated to off-world literature. It makes sense now that I think about it, but I assumed that it would be a more conventional library with some mediation-related content. I decided to drop the idea of checking out the book Waverly mentioned. Off-world literature sounds far more interesting to me. I used to read quite a lot when I was younger, so I'm curious to see how the literature of other systems differs. Making my way to the off-world fiction section, a combination of categories which seems somewhat ironic to me. I'm surprised to see a familiar face. Hey, Madeline. Hey, Winter. Checking out the library? Yeah, your roommate Waverly mentioned that they had books from other worlds here, so I thought I'd come check it out. You were talking to Waverly? Yeah, we have history of mediation together. Huh. She sure is a lot friendlier when Eerie isn't around. Is that so? Find anything interesting yet? She nods. It's all interesting, although kinda in a worrying way. Although most of the books here are good conquering evil, the extent of the evil is really disturbing. I'm not sure I actually want to read any of these, although I think they would be extremely useful for learning how other worlds work. Huh. I guess I'll take a look and see for myself then. I begin perusing the novels on the shelves and find that Madeline is correct with her first impressions. I'm only reading the backs and skimming through them, but they all seem to revolve entirely on bad stuff happening and people trying to stop it. I can definitely see how reading these would be useful for mediators. After all, we're kind of trying to do the same thing, aren't we? Stop bad stuff from happening. I decide that I should probably read at least one of these, and I'm sure it would be enlightening. I end up selecting a book whose plot revolves around time travel since the bad stuff in it seems relatively tame. Time travel is a thing in reality. I mean, I would have thought jumping between dimensions is impossible as well, so who knows? Time travel is a theoretical form of travel which transports matter back and or forward in time. It is currently considered impossible. The reader should note that a sufficiently powerful god could make it seem as though time travel is occurring or has occurred via reversing or speeding up the physical interactions in their universe or by rearranging matter into past or future states. This is not true to time travel, as all other planes will be unaffected by this physical transformation. It is also recommended that caution be exercised if time travel is mentioned on a plane where magic exists. Due to the nature of magical worlds, the potential of time travel being possible in the local sense previously mentioned, or in the true sense affecting other planes, cannot be ruled out. I 
wave goodbye to Malin, who has now ended up somewhat far away from me, and go to check out the book. I spend the rest of my evening reading, and what I find inside the book is fascinating. The world within is very similar to our own, although with many downsides not present in ours. For instance, people steal things. They are very rich and very poor, and people seem to be genuinely afraid that another person could kill them, although it never happens in the book. The weirdest part is undoubtedly when a war is mentioned to be happening on the other side of the planet like it's no big deal. Um, it's a war, people are dying on your planet, and yet nobody cares. It reads like some sort of twisted version of those bizarre horror stories where bad things happen to the main character and nobody does anything to help. Although it is very interesting, getting through the novel is a bit of a chore, since I find myself rereading the same sentences over and over to make sure I've absorbed their contents correctly. A lot of times I read phrases so outlandish that I feel like I must have missed a word somewhere, but it turns out not to be the case. Finally, as the sun sets, I lower the book to my side. I can't take any more of this. I don't want it to enter my dreams or anything. Eh. Welcome back. My roommate returns and sits at her desk, opening a book of her own. What are you reading anyway? Just some romance book. Okay. I decide not to press for details, since I assume her generic response means she doesn't want to dis discuss them. I'm pretty tired now anyway, to be honest. Reading that book was draining. I roll over and open my laptop to browse the net for a while before bed. There's nothing particularly interesting, especially compared to what I've learned today, but it passes the time. Around midnight, my roommate goes to bed and I decide to be considerate and do the same. I wake up immediately and sigh with relief. Today we only have practical classes. Those giant theory courses only happen on a 135 schedule, while the practical classes go by 2-4. Had to get a drink there, because my voice is starting to give out. Then again, I'm not great with anything requiring physical activity, and we have not one, but two physically intensive classes on 2-4. To call this school is going to be rough on every part of me. I sit up and notice Waverly looking at me. I decide to play her game for a change and don't bother greeting her. This doesn't seem to bother her, and she starts collecting her things before leaving. Maybe Kevin was right and I should just leave her be. It's not like Waverly has to like me. I do seem to be making a friend or two elsewhere anyway. It still feels bad though. In any case, it's time to get ready and head to the gym. I seem to know a decent amount of people in the class, Waverly, Ayo, and Irie are all here. Not sure how I feel about it, though. The only one I might consider a friend is Ayo, and... But really, I hardly know him at this point. I don't think you call one of our relationships between Irie and I a friendship, either. Hey, kids. How's the Theory been treating you? I and several others grumble. Nah, don't worry about it. It won't be rough for too long. You're... Souther, right? Doesn't take long for the nickname to spread around, eh? Souther. What a strange nickname. It just means he's a southerner. I suppose there must not be a lot of southerners here. How about I give you guys a proper introduction to myself while you all do laps around the gym? Nobody moves. Not a joke. Get moving, kids. We start jogging. Can you guys hear me over your running? Yes. Great. With this, the teacher comes up and begins to jog right beside us. I'm Walter Heinrich Dominguez, your physical education and self-defense teacher. I'm an alumnus from Telos. Me, Cyrus Addington, and Walter Liberens graduated in the same year. You know something there? Two Walters. We were in a pretty close group of friends back in the day. Could get confusing. So, so they started calling you Souther. No, no, not at first. We managed fine between ourselves, but when I started mentoring, so did Walt, and the confusion started up again with the students. I'm the only Southerner on the staff, so that's when people started calling me Souther. With names like Walter and Heinrich, he must have had some West in him too, though. As we pass our second lap, Mr. Dominguez turns to face us and starts running backward. Listen, class, I've got my pride. Some facts are just facts. I'm pretty excellent at my job. I may have started bad, but I eventually got a real hang for it. Feel free to use me as an inspiration. 
I'm proof that there's hope for everyone. A student mutters under his breath. That's some confidence. Somehow Souther manages to hear it. Why, thank you. My wife says it's endearing. Mr. Dominguez looks up at a clock on the wall. All right, stop, stop. We all slow to a stop. We ultimately completed just over four laps. Phew. Anyway, kids, don't worry about calling me by my proper name. Souther suits me just fine. All right, then. I think that's kind of a cute nickname. But enough about that. How are you all feeling? I'm a little tired already, but it's nothing awful. Most people just seem to be warmed up. Okay, listen up. I'm going to cheat a little today. We've got self-defense together after your next class, but I'm pretty sure you aren't going to be familiar with the concept. So we're just going to play one of the more intense sports out there to get you going. Dodgeball. Oh, no. Alright, uh, you. Name. Madeline Asen. Or Melanie Asen. He points to someone else. Name. Anton Antonov. You joking me? No. Well then, Antonov, Azen, go get the dodgeball card from the supply room. The rest of you? Hmm. Guess I'll figure out teams. Well, the two students he picked go off to complete their assignments, so they start sorting us seemingly at random into two opposing teams. When he's done and both Anton and Melanie have come back, I find myself on a team with one familiar face, Iriez. I will face Ayo and Waverly in the upcoming battle. Iria creeps over to me while Souther starts explaining the rules. What do we have here? Suppose I'm saddled with at least one weekly, huh? I suppose that you are. Alright, I'll watch your back. You hit him where it hurts, Tiger. What in the world are you talking about? Alright, that's it. Get going, kids. I'm taken by surprise. The students around me rush to the center of the court to where the balls were laid. All at once is utter chaos. Balls are everywhere. None of them are moving toward me, and I take the opportunity to move closer to the front lines. Oh, didn't take you for an aggressive one. <laughs> I notice the student on the other side squaring up with me as their target. I squad and prepare to attempt a catch. When they let loose, to my surprise, Eerie jumps in front of me and swipes it from the air. She then tosses me the ball. I told you I'd cover you. Let him have it. What is this? Some new form of bullying? I wind up to fire at a nearby student let loose. Predictably, I miss. Iria laughs. You can't throw for shit, girly! I'm aware of that, thanks. The game continues on like this, with Iria protecting me and me embarrassing myself. Iria certainly has a talent for this, but I was no slouch either. We end up playing several games, and then often end up and they often end up the remaining players. Despite my poor performance, I mostly enjoy it. My impression of Iria improves a little as well. After changing, I head to my lab class. Waverly seems to be in this one, too. Hey there, familiar faces! We got both regular and promising students together here, huh? Anyway, this will be a very informal lab class. Promising students? Oh yeah, I think there's some sort of upper echelon of students called promising. I wonder how they got into that before even coming here. Due to the nature of chaos, earnestly trying to get any part of it down to a science is a bit pointless. This course will be almost purely practical. Alright, that's good news for me. I like practical stuff. Since we discussed pollution yesterday, today we'll begin by observing it in action. As Earthen, we have a concept of pollution, but we don't really see it these days. So you might think it's obvious from a glance what's polluted and what's clean, but that's definitely not true. Pick up the leftmost vial on your table. Don't worry, it won't break. There's actually a spread of materials and containers on the table. I pick up the vial filled with something light gray and almost see-through. That contains smog, a type of polluted air. We've never had it on Earth, but it can be a big problem in more technologically advanced societies. What is it? It's not just smoke? It's not really smoke. The one in your hand is made up of exhaust fumes from cars and industrial emissions. We harvested it this morning and concentrated it to make it more visible. In the real world, it's not quite so dense. Sorry, what? What do you mean by exhaust fumes? Hold on, before I explain that, I'll explain another common source of smog. Anyone here remember how we tried to use coal how we tried to use coal for heating and such ages ago? I raised my hand. We stopped using it due to its negative effects on the health and environment. Yep, and that's a philosophy we tend to adhere to. If something is bad for us or the world around us, we don't use it. So to answer your question, uh 
Mr. Way. Cars in other worlds usually emit something called exhaust, which is similar to the reaction produced by burning coal, not just fumes. Furthermore, there are places where such fuels to power industry, which... Oh, you can consider industry to basically be huge facilities that make products or energy, but typically will create heavy pollution. Usually the fuel source for otherworldly vehicles and industrial complexes is something either plentiful and cheap. Cheap and plentiful is economical, after all, and other worlds tend to put economy above all else. Anyway, with enough cars and factories like that around and unchecked, smog can come about which is very unhealthy, potentially lethal in fact, and bad for the environment, of course. Compare the smog before you with the appearance of fog. You might find that they look only a little different from one another. If you go to another world and see this stuff hovering up over a city, try to avoid it. Even if you think it's fog, don't assume anything. Learn first, because as I said, this stuff can make you very sick and possibly kill you. Going back to cars, it's probably going to take a bit before you separate our idea of cars from the cars you'll be seeing elsewhere. Try not to be too surprised when you run into them. It's hard to imagine cars producing pollutants. There's quite a few of them around, so it seems like it would quickly become a problem. My mind wanders for a moment, and when it returns, Casey has begun to explain how to gauge weather qual water quality. They even pollute their water? I can't say I'm getting a good impression of other worlders. After lunch is the last day of the class, or the last class of the day. Self-defense, a term usually applied to justified acts of violence against animals. They attack you, you attack back to protect yourself. Judged by how the word murder is treated on other worlds, I have to imagine this term concerns itself with other humans instead of just animals, if animals even enter the equation in the first place. So basically, this will be a class to teach me how to defend myself against other sentient people. With these arms, I can't say I feel any confidence in my abilities. Yo, kids. We all greet Souther. So, do I need to explain to you all why we need this class? It's only the second day in, but you probably figured it out, right? People are probably going to try to hurt you out there. It's a nice idea to think you'll always be able to talk things out, but sometimes that isn't going to happen. Plus, even if you escape, which I'll admit is rather easy with the ICD, you're still going to be on some person's shit list. So when push comes to shove, you're going to have to smack somebody around, at least enough to get them off of you. Myself and many others aren't too excited by the prospect. I may be unusually weak, but Earth has produced many more lovers than fighters. I am far from alone. Look, I know what most of you are thinking. You're thinking you'll never be able to take on anyone earnestly trying to hurt you. Well, that's just not true. I'm not going to tell you how I used to be skinny and weak and eventually got stronger. That's not true either. I've actually been pretty strong all my life, and I've known my share of what you'd call weaklings. It's honestly not that hard for a person lacking muscles to turn the tables on an attacker, for starters. That's what I'll be teaching you all. That said, muscles definitely help. I'll try to get you guys fit over the course of the semester, too. Uh. Lastly, though I prefer just using fists, I'm going to be instructing you in the use of various weapons you might come across on mediations. This knowledge could save your life. So there claps twice. Alright, enough talk. Let's get started. He begins to pair us up once more seemingly at random. I end up paired with the girl who sits next to me during social studies and technology, Laura. We're going to assume any enemies you face will be human for now. Obviously, or not obviously, come to think of it, not everyone you face will be a human equivalent. Still, with some observation, you should be able to apply these techniques to most anything you come across. Basically, you've got to think about what you can hit on the other person that's sensitive, and what you can use to hit them with. Look over your partner. On their body, they've got several weak points. From front, top to bottom, there's the eyes, nose, throat, solar plexus, groin, knees, shins, and tops of the feet. When another person like this rolls up on you wishing to bring you harm, these are the kinds of places you target. One of you turn around and let the other see your back. I decide to do so. Okay, from behind, top to bottom, we've got the kidneys, the groin again, and the knees again, which can be hit from the side. Once you're done looking, tell your partner and switch. I face Laura again after her cue and look her over. Thinking about it, these places are all definitely harsh places to be injured. It's difficult for me to imagine actually trying to hurt somebody using them. I might jokingly punch somebody in the arm or flick them on the head, but... If I were to put my all into striking these parts, I think even my fledging weight could manage to break a few things on the other person. It's a rather grotesque realization. Laura turns back around and we return our attention to Souther. Now, look over yourself. You've got to strike with safe and effective parts of your body. For starters, look at your hands. Hands are, in my opinion, the best available weapons in most situations, as long as you've got them free at the time. 
I like to think it's best to take only your hands and nothing else on a mediation. For one thing, you're not going to misplace them on another world, and even if you do, they're just hands. Nothing strange about them. I don't want to think how you could end up misplacing your hands. Even bringing a completely foreign weapon into another world or society can have hugely chaotic ramifications. To lose it can be a practical damnation. It's not like something bad will always happen if you bring something along with you, but I've taken to only gathering objects I find in the world itself rather than potentially causing trouble. Consequently, I've become quite the pugilist. I trust my hands more than anything else on a mediation. Now then, that was a bit of a sidetrack. I'm not even going to be teaching you how to punch today. I'm a mentor as well, so I figured a little extra knowledge on mediation itself couldn't hurt. Now, let's get back to the lesson. While you're not going to be learning to punch yet, your hands are still very viable tools in an altercation, mainly your fingers and your palms. Making fists can also be useful even if you're not actually going to use them in a jab or anything. You've also got your elbows, your lower thighs, and your own feet. Anyone want to tell me how you can use these weapons against targets on another human being? I see Irie eagerly raise her hand. Go ahead. You could point your fingers and stab a bloke in the eyes, or make fists and pound them into the side of your head, of their head. Or just punch them in the throat. Bash their nose with your fist and elbow and all that. Or, you know, elbow their kidney or knee in the groin works for both ladies and boys. They're for boys, obviously. Or you just kick them a bunch. If you can get them to trip or push them over, it's easy to lay into them when they're on their ground. Wow. You're very enthusiastic. I've given this quite a bit of thought. Really? Well, can't say I expected to ever meet someone else like that. Usually people here hate thinking that way. Anyway, Garrett here is right, and I doubt her very spirited exp explanation didn't leave an impression on you all. The basic idea is this. Use what's available to hit what's available. Pretty much everything she described gave you lose on an of an attacker. These aren't takedowns, though. They might shut a person down, but they're also pretty likely to just make them mad. Always be ready to run or escape. Hopefully your defense will dissuade any future attempts by your attacker. Pain is a powerful deterrent. I'll now demonstrate how to perform these strikes. So that proceeds to do simple motions on an invisible attacker. He points at where the eye should be, sideswipes in their matching nose, grabs around the shoulders to get in a knee, shows how to grab at a man's testes while being attacked from behind, and so on. Once he's finished, he asks us to fake spar with our partners. We're to get used to our range and come to understand our capabilities. We take turns being attacker and defender, and practice hitting the key points with our key weapons. Throughout the process, I feel very uncomfortable. I can't find joy in trying to hurt someone. Even if someone were to try to hurt me, as near inconceivable as it is, I would much rather talk out the conflict or run away altogether. If I were to be grabbed and the assailant was unreasonable, though, I suppose I have no other choice but to fight. I don't know how teleporting with ICD works, but whether it's flashy or subdued, a person can suddenly vanish from beneath one of the grass, which surely cause a fuss. I may not know much of anything about chaos, but surely that would be very chaotic. But is it okay to hurt another person just to prevent myself from being hurt? Does it matter if they're bad people? This is not a problem I can solve today, I think. We spend the rest of the class practicing. Laura seems about as unenthused as I. I'm interrupted on my way back to my room. Winter Harrison, can I help you? I challenge ye to a duel. What? Did all that talk of hurting people get her fired up or something? A duel on the fields of foosball. Oh, thank goodness. Hey, Winter. Madeline walks up to us from around the corner that Eerie and I had appeared from. And seeing her reminds me to stick up for myself. Why should I? I don't even like foosball. Go play with someone else. Alright, how about this? You beat me, I'll tell you my theory on why you and your roommate don't get along. Actually, that's a pretty tempting offer. Madeline may be right that she doesn't know, but at least now I'm potentially getting something out of spending time with Irie. Other than abuse, of course. Deal. Onward! We move to the rec room together, where luckily the foosball table is still free. I move to the blue side while Iria takes the red. The ball returns on my side, so I reach for the ball and get ready to drop it. Ready? Always. 
I drop the ball and Irie instantly pounds into my goal. I'm not surprised. I wouldn't expect Irie to invite me to do anything she wasn't good at. I'm not giving up, though. We continue on with Irie absolutely outclassing me at every turn. It's frustrating, but I won't allow her the satisfaction of an early victory. I'll keep playing until she tires of it. As I grew used to her moves, I managed to start blocking some of her passes and get some shots on net. Seems to work against me, though, as the more challenge I provide, the more she gets fired up. She frantically moves from side to side as she makes and receives passes between her players. To say I'm unable to keep up there is an understatement. I can't even keep sight of the ball sometimes. Nevertheless, I tense my body and do my best to control my players and protect her shots. After 8 or 9 games, I finally start getting some goals. It's not much to be proud of, but it's something. On our 11th game, or was it the 12th, she sighs and starts taking it easy on me. I'm rather surprised to see it. I didn't know Irie was capable of mercy. She even goes as far as to allow me to win this one, although she still makes it a tight game. Oh my, seems you've finally busted me. Her voice is dripping in sarcasm. I don't bother playing along. You weren't even touching your goalie for most of the game. I appreciate the handicap, but don't patronize me. Yeah, yeah, sorry. I must say, I'm impressed with you, though. You didn't give up or complain. I played lots of sore loses already, and I was getting tired of them. Thanks. Anyway, a deal's a deal. I'll tell you my theory. You sure? I didn't properly win. Hmm. How about I give you a clue, then? That seem fair? Yeah, what is it? Well, you're a smart girl, so you may have already thought of this, but... If it's true that you didn't do anything to earn your treatment, then doesn't it stand to reason that she might be cold to you due to something outside of your control? And if that's the case, then being kind to her will never help, right? Because how you act isn't the problem. If you want to become friends with her, then you'll have to figure out the real cause of her behavior and address that. Makes sense. You're surprisingly observant, Irie. I didn't expect that from you. What a backhanded compliment. Perhaps I'm a bad influence on you, girly. Anyway, I have to go to the bathroom. With this, she confidently strolls off. <sighs> she sure is something. Yeah. But I think you're starting to see why she's not as bad as she first seems. There's a good heart in there somewhere. Anyway, want to have a game? You should stand a much better chance against me. Sure. Mal and I start playing while we wait for Irie to return, and I do much better against her. She still beats me, though. Just barely. When Irie comes back from the toilets, Mal and I form a team to try to take her on together. I take control of the two defensive roles, rows while she takes the offensive. We fare better against her than I did on my own, but nevertheless, we are dominated. We played well into the evening, and when I return to my room, it's already becoming dark. Waverly is in her chair, reading as she typically is. I lay down on my bed and reflect on Irie's advice. What's beyond my control? That could be upsetting my roommate. I can't really think of anything. Maybe they'll come to me tomorrow. Another day, another series of bone-chilling revelations. I'm not much looking forward to it. Morning, everyone. Morning. Last time we went over the very beginnings of mediation, and today we're going to talk about its development as a profession. Back in 4988, back in 4989, Telos Kokonos, who is our chapter's namesake, was killed while mediating on another world. Until then, the few mediators we had, then referred to as planar scouts, operated out of the planar schools that were established in 4865 as independent contractors. With Telos's death, other scouts cried foul. In 4990, the planar schools were restructured and formed in the mediation schools we know today. The individual schools are referred to as chapters and carry the names of the initial planar scouts, the first mediators. The new rules and regulations that came with the formation of formal schools resulted in mediation becoming a much safer occupation. He continues on detailing the new rules and processes that were implemented. It's rather dry. Hey, kids. Hey, Hayden. 
So last time we discussed war and territory rights. Someone summarized territory stuff. People in other worlds are usually really concerned about ownership and property, at least compared to us, who consider all territory to be owned by everyone and only divided and assigned for the purpose of creating a functioning society. That's right, Heather. In the first place, it's weird to think that a human could own land. What is land? Is it the dirt in an area? Is it volume? How far does it go down? What about upwards? Do the laws of the state apply on your land? If so, is it truly yours? Really odd, and speaking of odd, hey, let's talk about privacy. How much do you guys care about your privacy? Most of us, including myself, shrug. It's not a big concern. Why don't you care about your privacy? A weird question, but I'll bite, I guess. I suppose it's because there's nothing about me I'm afraid of others knowing. That's pretty much how we tend to feel about it, yeah. That mindset doesn't fly in other worlds, though. It works here because we have a good government and good people. But if a government or its people are bad, privacy becomes very useful. So it allows people to privately have opinions or lifestyles that the mainstream does not accept. On the subject of comparing governments, most worlds would consider our government to be a very dangerous one since a small group of elites decide all our laws and the common man has no say. What's wrong with that? In most worlds, the elite do not have the well-being of their people at heart, and they tend to abuse their power and privileges for their own gain. This is why many of the best off-world governments implement controls on power, which allow the common people to replace bureaucrats if they disagree with their policies. On Triday, I was told our government censors information. Is that bad too? Censorship is usually considered distasteful in other worlds. Withholding information is seen as a sign of untrustworthiness. Many would rather all government secrets be exposed. Which is rather ironic, considering that most of these people would be rather upset having their privacy invaded. But that's besides the point. And come to think of it, not entirely the same anyway. Oh. And I think censorship can be a good thing, by the way. Certain information is dangerous, and would be best suppressed. For instance, the methods to create homemade bombs, or particularly potent poison. For that matter, even knowing something horrifying has happened at all could be bad since it could inspire others to replicate the event. Anyway, despite this, the truth is often sought after because other worlders tend to fear the unknown. We, on the other hand, tend to accept that there are things that do not concern us, and we are fine not knowing about them. I'm kind of disparaging other worlders here, but to be honest, oftentimes their desire for what's hidden for them is justified, since sometimes it is hidden with malicious intent. Nothing is ever absolute in other planes. There are benefits and disadvantages to censorship, and the truth can be helpful or hurtful. What I want you to take away from this discussion is an appreciation that our world is a unique case, and that you shouldn't blindly apply our philosophies or laws on your travels. You could cause even greater problems, so be on your toes. Hey everyone, getting right into it last time we discussed pollution, as you might have guessed yes after yesterday's lab. That's basically the theme of this week. I think we've spread quite enough doom and gloom over the last two days, though, so this class I'd like to play Devil's Advocate on the side of Otherworlders. Well, I wish her luck. It's easy to start thinking of these people as awful or stupid compared to us, but like many things you'll be encountering in mediation, so the circumstances are rarely ever black and white. To put it in perspective, consider locusts. You're not starting off well, Miss McClellan, comparing them to insects. Well, um, well, I need to illustrate my point. Waverly chuckles. Anyway, what I want to say was locusts consume without regard to anything but themselves. It's a basic instinct of survival. These grasshopper swarms will eat and eat and eat, traveling huge distances out of their need to survive. As a result, they leave crops and ruins. My point is that the grasshoppers harbor no ill will. Because they want to live, and consuming is how they do so. We are only different because we have the benefit of perspective. We know that if we consume everything today, there will be nothing tomorrow. Otherworlders often know this as well, but lack the societal unification required to place the future above the present. Oftentimes, due to poor distribution of wealth, they have no choice but to exploit their planet to survive. Sometimes, yes, it's pure greed, but that is the case less often than you might expect. We on Earth live in a very good time now, so the dread of starvation, of freezing to death, or of losing some preventable disease is foreign to us. There was a time when those things were not foreign, when we had to choose between polluting our environment while living in comfort and preserving it, when, while, and preserving it while living in want. 
It was a great sacrifice on our part to go with the second option, and many, many people suffered for the greater good. Most other worlders chose the first option, and to be honest, I find it difficult to blame them. It is the incorrect choice, but the correct one comes with such a high price that it's a difficult sell, especially to a less unified population. So, real quick, what she's talking about here, if you're familiar with Nash's game theory, this is where all of that comes into play, how it's the prisoner's dilemma that's the best way to describe it, and probably the most popular way. So basically, two guys are... They committed a crime, we'll be honest. They are uh, uh, detained by the police and being interrogated. So they have the option of... They can snitch on the other guy and receive a reduced sentence, but their partner will re re uh, receive an enhanced sentence. So to give you numbers, let's say the snitch will get one year. The person that is being snitched on will get five years. And if the... If you choose not to snitch, there's a, you'll get, say, three years. And this choice is given to both of them. So if neither of them snitch, they can... Well, that's the other caveat. If neither of them snitch, there's no evidence and they actually get to go free. So do you want to play it safe and perhaps not snitch? And on the off chance, you will go free? Do you want to play it safe and take one year at the expense of your friend, partner, accomplice? And if you both snitch, then you both get the three-year sentence or the five-year or something like that. I forgot the exact details. So, if you could actually unify, you could take the best option, but that's not exactly how game theory works. It, more often than not, encourages Delta Crossing. On your travels, you need to remember that they are still thinking and feeling people. They are not all monsters. They aren't exactly like you or me, no, but they're still people. They're alive and they want to live. Really, remember that. Many of them can do much better if they only have someone to help them along. Miss McClellan seems to feel very strongly about this, and I must admit that it's nice to hear a more compassion view of other worlders, as we to consider them misguided animals. I suppose I can sympathize with them more now. Goodness, what a lecture. The teacher continues class by explaining the finer details of Monopoly and big business in the context of peoples and their environments. It's a lot to take in. Glad it's lunchtime, as I think I need a break to process what I've just learned. I need to stop by the bathroom first, though. Okay, for a second there, I thought they were going to show the kids smoking in the bathroom, but that's a relief. As I exit the facilities, I hear rhythmic clacking on the floor. Looking to my right, I see a rather cool-looking woman with dark sunglasses and a white cane. Is she blind? I wait for her to move past to minimize the chance of me impeding her way, but instead she stops in front of me. Something the matter, kid? No. Why? Well, you're just standing there. Oh, that's because... I pause it seems too blunt and somehow disparaging to say because I didn't want to get in your way. She seems to figure it out on her own regardless. Relax. I'm not that blind, you know? The cane is just for things at my feet. I can see what's in front of me. Well, see might be an exaggeration, but I can tell when there's a young boy watching me, for example. Um... Oh wait, that's the girl's bathroom, isn't it? Sorry, kid. I'm rather disappointed that's my previous location that caused her to realize her mistake. Anyway, since we've been talking this long already, I might as well introduce myself. Name's Margaret. I'm a mediator here. Really? I didn't know you could be a mediator when you're... Uh... For all intents and purposes, you can call me blind, sweetie. I don't mind. Certainly compared to a normal person, that's what I am, after all. In any case, a blind person can be a mediator. It's much more dangerous, but as long as they're willing to accept the risk, then it's possible. I suppose I shall mention that I wasn't blind when I started, so I had the benefit of my experience from the time when I could see. Interesting. Anyway, I'm Winter Harrison, a first-year student. I figured you were a student. Might be seeing you later, then. I mentor first years sometimes. I am so gonna feel sorry for this woman if she's partnered up with the Irie. In any case, you best be running along. I don't want you attending class with an empty stomach on my account. Alright, it was nice meeting you. Likewise, kid. 
Mark continues on her way while I go in the opposite direction toward the cafeteria. Hey gang, lunch good? It was. Great, so earlier today I realized I mentioned something called a bomb. Some of you more enterprising students might have already taken the time to look that up, but I figure I should give a better rundown on them before I start our real lecture. And trust me, bombs can be very, very relevant in the first game. <laughs> a bomb is a device used to cause fairly severe destruction and or damage. Like guns, there's something we've never made on Earth. We do have something analogous to bombs that occurs in nature, though. Consider the carpenter ant. A certain species of carpenter ant, the Compotinus cinerosi, can explode while defending others. What? They rupture their own bodies, causing a poison from glands all along their side. Releasing a poison from all along their side? The process is called autothysis, and obviously leaves the ant dead. I'm not well versed in biology, but I think the Compotinus center aside provides a good context for people to understand the nature of bombs. They also have the benefit of leading into another concept, self-sacrificial terrorism. Does everyone know what suicide is? It's when an animal kills itself since it's scared, depressed, or I guess, defending something. Also, sometimes parasites can cause them to kill themselves, but that's our definition. Are you suggesting it can apply to humans? It can apply to people? Yes, nice work, Barry. This is a social study, so I won't go into every detail behind intelligent suicide. Instead, I'll focus on suicide bombing. Putting it simply, the terrorist kills itself and usually many others to make a statement and, well, spread terror. There's more to it, but I digress. Terrorism isn't a subject you'll have to deal with anytime soon. Sorry, I've done seen a nerdgasm over social behavior, history, and technologies. Let's get back to business. I introduced you all to guns last time because of how common and dangerous they are, but the process I skipped over was usually thousands and thousands of years of weapons development. Today I'm going to go through the typical technological lifestyle life cycle of worlds, which will hopefully help you do a better job mediating by understanding where these people come from. What you first need to understand, though, is the fundamental difference that myself and surely other teachers here have started to drill into your head. Earth humans do not equal otherworlders. You'll be meeting many people who look like humans on your travels. They are not humans. They will call themselves humans, but they are not the same as you or I. I can't stress enough how important it is to be aware of this. Never assume they will behave like you think they will. Actually, never assume anything on another world. Note that out of the way, otherworlders and their history. Hayden starts going on about how humans, or I mean people, on other worlds developed. It starts out remarkably similar to our world, but quickly diverges in terms of speed of their development and the things they develop. Quite frankly, it's horrifying, and the goodwill that I built toward them from Casey's class quickly leaves me. Not only did they invent guns, but also guns that shoot thousands of projectiles a minute, and guns that shoot projectiles that explode! They also invent planes for dropping bombs, and then planes for blowing up planes that drop bombs, and then planes for blowing up other planes that blow up planes that drop bombs. It's almost darkly comical how it seems with every new invention the other worlders also invent something to destroy it. By the end of class, the methods of murder have all blurred in my mind, and I'm not sure what I've truly learned. As nihilistic as it sounds, I can't help but remember what the sniper said in his video. As long as there are two people alive, one will want the other dead. It's apt. Hello again, class. Before we get started, I'd like to remind you all that your first weekly review exam will be tomorrow afternoon. Seems like even going to specialty school is enough to escape the weekly review system. Although I suppose I'm not really surprised. We haven't gone over much material yet since this week is a short week, but you should all still study. It won't be easy. Moving along, I think it's about time we discuss gods, as their existence, or lack thereof, as well as people's beliefs regarding them can be very important in many worlds. For starters, I don't believe I've even heard that word before. Gods. Judging by my peers' reaction, I'm not alone. I imagine none of you know what gods are. We shake our heads. To make this simple to understand, imagine authors. Fiction authors, to be specific. Authors can forge entire worlds, albeit imaginary ones. They set the laws, create the lives which live there, and often dictate how the stories of the world will proceed. Gods are authors of reality. Uh... Is this old man saying we live in a book? Is there an author for our reality? We're fairly certain there isn't. 
I have assigned you a few articles to read detailing the evidence that our plane was born from chaos, not any specific will. What about, uh, existence? Was that made by gods? To my surprise, Henry shrugs. Maybe. There's no real evidence either way. In either case, it matters very little as if there is an author. They are most certainly not a very active one. Hmm. So, like, do gods exist in their own work? Sometimes a god may have a physical form, and sometimes they may not. Sometimes they may actively interact with their world, and sometimes they may not. There are likely many worlds where gods exist, but because they do not interact with their world or have a physical form, we will never know. So if a god is like an author, then they can do anything in their own world? Make anything happen? We would usually say so, yes, although there are beings we would consider gods that only have some power instead of absolute power over their worlds. But before we go too far into the particulars of gods, it would be best to understand the basics first. We'll begin with discussing an average plane inhabited by gods. Plane 473 is home to a pantheon. A pantheon is essentially a community of gods. After Mr. Penn's class, I end up wandering into the hall trying to figure out how a world with a god and a world without one could interact. I mean, if a god can create anything in their own world, then let's say they create a starship that can travel faster than light, which is theoretically impossible in ours. If we then brought that starship to our world, would it still work? Would we even be able to bring it to our world? Maybe I'll visit Mr. Penn's office sometime and see if he knows the answer. Hey, Winter. As I'm pontificating, Kevin appears from a nearby classroom. Hey, Kevin. What are you up to now? Good question. I'm not sure. Nothing special, I guess. Cool. Wanna go for a run with me, then? Io was supposed to come here with me, but he bailed to go hang out with some girls. Every fiber of my being screams no at this proposition. I am not really one for exercise that is enforced by a curriculum. I did say I would start changing my habits at the school, though, and running would be a nice habit to get into, but... Isn't it getting kind of close to supper for running? Maybe, but isn't that even better? Won't be weighed down by a full stomach and we can build up an appetite for later. I guess... Alright, I'll go with you, but I warn you, I'm not in very good shape. Awesome! And yeah, don't feel pressure to keep up with me. There's a trail that goes around the campus, and I'm going to run the whole thing since it's part of my regimen. But if you need to stop midway or switch to a walk, then go ahead. I'll wait for you at the end anyway, and then we can grab supper when we're done. Alright. We head outside and Kevin leads me to the start of the trail. Once there, he starts doing stretches and I mimic him, not really having any idea how to properly stretch myself. When he's finished, he turns to me. We'll start with a walk and switch to a jog once we've loosened up. Sounds good? We start off at a brisk pace. So this is kind of new. Didn't think they actually had any CGs like this. As we walk, Kevin brings up where I'm from and we begin conversing about our homes. Seems we're both centerlanders, so there's a lot of similarities. Kevin is from a much larger city than me, though, and it's interesting to hear about the differences between big and small city life. After a short while, Kevin declares that it's time to start jogging, and so we pick up the pace. Rather embarrassingly, I'm already a bit winded from walking and taking, talking at the same time, and I don't think I'm going to be able to last long. I wonder how long this trail is. Kevin said that it encircles the campus, but we haven't looped back yet. It'll cost me some of my precious oxygen, but I decide to ask about it. How far will, be, will be, we be running? I think it's about five kilometers. Five? Oh my goodness, I can already feel my motivation training in response to this new knowledge. However, I won't allow myself to be so easily defeated. Oh. My. Gosh. How far have we gone now? I try to speak normally, but I can't manage it while keeping up with Kevin's pace. I'd say we have about a kilometer left. If it's okay with you, I'm going to sprint the last kilometer. I huff and puff my reply. Yeah, sure, that's fine. Alright, meet you back on campus. Yeah. Kevin takes off at an impressive speed. Kevin's endurance really serves to underline my own lack of fitness. I highly doubt I'm ever going to become the type of person who runs every day, but I really should be taking better care of myself. With this thought in mind, I push myself to continue my jog for the remaining kilometer. I 
Eventually I make it back to campus, totally exhausted. Kevin is waiting there for me, looking no worse for wear. Hey, look like you made it the whole way without walking. Good job, to be honest, I didn't think you had it in you. I might have been insulted by his honesty, if not for the accuracy of his opinion. Thanks. Do you mind if we just sit a bit before we go to the cafeteria? Yeah, no problem. We take a seat on a nearby bench while I recover from the ordeal. When we arrive at the cafeteria, it's already somewhat late. There aren't too many students left. Ayo is here, though. Ayo, are the ladies done with you now? I told you, it was a promising students thing. A lot of them just happen to be girls. Sure, man, sure. Oh, you're a promising student, Ayo? Yep. How did you get chosen for that? You know what? I'm not sure. I'm assuming it had something to do with my aptitude tests. I think the title of Promising Student is something you have to progressively earn, though. It's not a permanent thing. Like, I think you can get promoted or demoted as the year goes on, depending on your performance. It probably doesn't mean that much I'm, that I'm considered one right now. And it's likely just they just had to select some students to see the group, you know. Interesting. So you're saying I could steal your spot and hang out with those ladies in your place? You... Do something that cruel to me? Of course. No hesitation. It's what you get for ditching me. Maybe. Maybe later I could do something to make it up to you. You could start by cutting it out. Alright, alright, fine. Anyway, the meeting I had to go to was only an introduction to the differences in our curriculum with Mr. Penn. Shouldn't be a regular thing, so I can go with you next time. Cool. I'm not really upset, by the way. Yeah, I know. Jeez. I feel like I'm witnessing the birth of a bromance or something. The run has really caught up with me now. I'm just going to shower, browse the net, and then head to bed, I think. I got more exercise in today than I have in months. I think I've earned it. I wake up in a good mood. It's finally time for a break, at least until this afternoon. Normally I'd use some of my free time to study for the weekly test, but I don't think I'll bother this time. Since the first week, there's only three days to review instead of the usual five, and on top of that, what we've learned thus far has been so baffling that it's seared into my mind. In any case, before I decide what to do with my time today, let's get some breakfast. On my way back from the cafeteria, I run into Ayo. Hey girl, what you up to? Hey Ayo. I was just on my way back to my room. Got plans? Not really. I'm probably just going to read, I guess. Hmm. Want to play some frisbee with me instead? I guess frisbee wouldn't be too tiring. I do seem to have some energy back from yesterday. Sure. Cool. Let me just run back to my room to get the disc. Is Kevin going to be joining us? Nah, that meat has lifting weights in the gym. I've always preferred aerobic exercise myself, so I was looking for someone to play with. Anyway, wait here. I'll be right back. He runs off. Ayo seems like a nice guy, but he might be one of those people with too much energy for me. When Ayo returns, we exit the dorms and find a patch of grass to play on. We'll just toss it around then. No need to get fancy, right? Sure. I don't even know how one gets fancy with a flying disc anyway. I assume he must be referencing one of those sports I don't play. Ayo runs a little ways before swinging around and tossing me the frisbee. I have to run and jump in order to catch it. Nice catch. That throw was a bit off, sorry. I'm actually rather impressed myself as I'm not typically capable of even the most minor athletic feats. We continue playing for a while, stop and take a break when it nears lunchtime. I'm kind of surprised to see you around, Ayo. Aren't you a promising student? Shouldn't you be studying? Nah, I've never needed to study. What? Never? Is that really so weird? It's not like any of those tests at school were hard. What? I had to study a lot to get my grades as good as they were. Am I actually an idiot or something? Ayo cracks a smile at my reaction. Don't freak out, I'm just kidding. I have studied for lots of tests. I'm just not worried about this one specifically. 
I promised that students get extra classes, and this week it was mostly spent reviewing and expanding what we learned in our regular classes. Apparently after the first week and a half it changes to unique material, though, which means I'm going to have to study even more than anyone else. You know, it's a bit hard to look at this promising student thing like something I want when it's just going to make me work harder. But it's cool! I blurt this out with a bit more force than I had planned. You think so? Yeah, I mean, I've always wanted to be exceptional at something since I've never really been much good at anything I've tried. So I think you should be proud of how well you're doing, even if it's more work. Hmm. I guess it does feel kind of nice to be better than you. Wow. That's the last time I tried to make you feel better, then. He chuckles. You know what? You've inspired me. I think I'll go study a bit after all. Oh, great. What are you going to do after this? Go eat lunch and take a nap, maybe. Oh, so you've already finished studying, then? I'm beginning to see why you're not good at anything. Rude. Alright, anyway, I'm off. You should try to study at least a bit. He heads back into the dorm. I sigh to myself and make my way to the cafeteria. I guess I should study at least a bit after I eat. My confidence has been eroded now. I didn't study, and I regret everything. I found myself looking at questions wherein when we were taught the answer, was there some reading I was supposed to do? We do have a textbook, but I didn't think we'd be needing it already. Hmm, if the system with low chaos tends to order, then maybe my guesses will tend towards the correct answers. I covered myself with this theory, despite having disproven it many times over the years. Oh well, I suppose I'll just take this as a lesson that weekly exams are not to be trifled with. Thankfully, despite my lack of knowledge, I'm able to logic my way to some of the correct answers, so hopefully my grade won't be too low. Well, that's that done. And on the bright side, now my weekend can begin for real. I stretch my arms above my head and think about how to spend the rest of my day. I think I'll take that library book I borrowed to the rec room and try to do some reading. I'm too liable to be tempted by my bed if I read in the room, and I have to maintain a regular sleep schedule now that I have classes again. When I arrive, there's a familiar face sitting in front of the TV, holding a console controller. Hey, Jack. He pauses the game and turns to me. Oh, hey, Winder. Wanna join me? Just got to a checkpoint, so now's a good time. Sure. I didn't really want to read that much anyway. What game will we be playing? Jack leans in and swaps discs in the machine. Ponal Pon. It's a puzzle game. Oh, I've played that game before. It's fun. Glad you think so. The game starts booting up and the familiar main menu music begins to play. I'm going to give myself a handicap since I played this a lot. Is that okay? Yep. You're not secretly really good, are you? I'm not. Jack begins setting up a two-player match, giving himself a hefty handicap. We begin playing, and the competition is heated, although it's hard to feel very good about since Jack is playing on a much higher difficulty. Nevertheless, we have a lot of fun, and after a few games, we decide to relax a bit by switching to the two-player cooperative mode. So how was your first week? Good, I guess. I still find this whole thing a bit surreal, though. Yeah, tell me about it. I'm still really weirded out by my ICE. Like, it links with our thoughts, yeah, and listens for commands, right? So doesn't that mean it's listening to our thoughts all the time? Oh my gosh, I never thought of that. That's kind of creepy. Right? I'm sure it doesn't record anything we don't tell it to, but it's weird to think that it could. But anyway, that aside, I'm glad I made at least one friend here so far. Really? Who is it? Ouch. I was talking about you, bud. Oh, sorry. Yeah, we're friends, I think. I just assumed you meant someone else. Like your roommate or something. Nah, we don't have anything in common. We're nice to each other, but there's nothing really there, you know? Yeah, I get it. I don't really get along with my roommate well, either. Really? Why not? I don't know. She's just treated me coldly ever since we first met. I kind of want to find out what's wrong and do something about it, but I can't figure out what she doesn't like about me. If you want to know, then just ask her. I can't do that. Why not? It's too direct and kind of rude, isn't it? 
Who cares about that? If you want to know, then just ask her. Just going around worrying and wondering about it is dumb. Just ask, she'll tell you, and then you'll be done with it. But what if she won't tell me? Then you're no off worse than you started, are you? I guess that's true. You might be right, but I think being so straightforward is probably impossible for me. Fine, don't do it. But as long as you don't, then you're not allowed to complain. Because you have the solution, you're just too much of a coward to enact it. Well, I can see that you at least have no problem being blunt. I know. And I know it's cost me some friends. But I just can't stand the BS people go through to spare the feelings of others. It's a waste of time, in my opinion. Well, sorry for being a waste of time. Come on, don't be like that. I'm being honest with you instead of just ignoring your problems because I like and respect you. I thought you could handle it. Don't prove me wrong. I sigh. Oh, fine. I guess you do have a point, despite being a bit of an ass about it. Thanks for being reasonable. On that topic, you can be as blunt as you want with me. I won't get mad. I'd be a hypocrite if I couldn't take as much as I dish out. Don't expect me to participate in that offer. I think how you go about things is wrong, and I don't want you to incur I don't want to encourage it. I think you should be considerate of others. Well, maybe you'll bring me around to your way of thinking eventually. I doubt it, but it's possible. Let's hope it is. So right now I'm kind of hoping there's a spin-off where you can mediate as Jack or something. I have a feeling it'd be something like... I don't know if you guys are familiar with how Harry Truman or Lyndon B. Johnson did their stuff, but if you don't know, Truman's nickname was Give Him Hell Harry, and LBJ was the guy who got up in your face and gave you the business. If you don't know, you may be interested to look it up, and all of a sudden you'll probably think to yourself, okay, maybe Trump is actually fitting up older mold. As twisted as that sounds. We play for a little while longer while talking about less sensitive subjects before I leave to go get supper. On my way back from the cafeteria, I run across Margaret. She's still sitting on a bench and looks to be staring into space. Or I assume she is. I'm not sure considering her condition. Having no other plans, I decide to say hello. Hello, Margaret. Oh, winter, right? That's right. Wanna have a seat? I'd like to talk with you. I'd like to talk with you about something for a bit. Sure, but what do you have to talk to me about? I take a seat to the left of the mediator. Well, it doesn't have to be you specifically, I suppose. I just have a moral problem that I'm trying to work out. So I'd like to hear another person's opinion on it, especially one still young and uncorrupted. Uncorrupted? I don't want to discourage you, girl. But this job wears you down over time. It makes it hard to see what's right and wrong. You spend so much time looking at greys that you can't tell if they're closer to white or black anymore. That sounds worrying. I see. So what's the moral problem you're talking about? Margaret leans back on the bench. On our world when a person is suffering, like when they're at the end of their life, for example, we allow them the choice of death over pain. The mercy laws. We learned about them in school. Historically, it has always been accepted in Earth and society that if a person is suffering, they have the right to die. The belief has been so prevalent that many weapons and poisons have been invented explicitly for the purpose of granting a quick and painless death of those who choose it. In fact, prior to the world government, euthanization was considered so natural that few companies, few countries had laws regarding it. On medical records where mercy killings occurred, the cause of death would simply be listed as suffering. However, after the world government was formally the oligarch was formed, the oligarchy merged existing laws. And so the first universal euthanization law came to be. Interestingly, there was a period where society regressed with respect to euthanization. This was during the chaos spike in 4850. During this time, euthanization skyrocketed for various reasons. Firstly, there were more diseases, disorders, and accidents, which caused the number of those suffering to rise greatly. More egregiously, however, the number of those euthanized for an unlisted reason also rose. This led to additional restrictions on the mercy laws. By the time chaos levels had begun to decline, what could only be euthanized by meeting the following requirements? Number one. The requester's suffering must be severe enough that they are incapable of participating in society, i.e. they cannot work. Two. 
the requester's condition must be terminal with death, ex with death expected in less than six months. Number three. The requester must submit an initial request, as well as a confirmation two weeks later. These limits on the law made it more or less inapplicable for most people, which was the intention. The tragedies occurring on Earth were causing a labor shortage, which was in turn causing famines and other misfortunes, and therefore people can be allowed to end their lives so it worsen the problem. These conditions led to some of the first ever recorded unassisted suicides in Earth's society. Once mediation began and chaos levels were lessened, these restrictions were removed from law, and it was restored to its original wording. Yes, you're a knowledgeable one, aren't you? Heh. <laughs> so our moral position is that it is okay to end a life if the person is suffering and wants to die. But here's another case. What if the person is suffering and wants to live? Well, if they're willing to withstand their pain, then their wish should be respected. Yes, I agree with that, but let's further complicate the matter. Let's say that the person in question was soon to die anyway, and everything that remained between them and death was increasingly unpleasantness. Their desire to live stems from only their fear of death and from a belief that somehow they will escape it. You, however, know for certain that they won't. Would it be acceptable, then, to save them from their torture? I don't hesitate. No, of course not. None of the conditions you mentioned matter. A person can't override another person's will to live. If they want to withstand their pain, no matter how foolish they are for doing so, they should be allowed. Mark gives a small smile at my answer. So, you would allow a person to pointlessly suffer just to maintain your belief that taking their life can never be justified. That's a strange way to put it, but I guess so. So what do you think of a person who thought otherwise? Someone who mercy killed another person against their will? Would their intentions lessen their crime? My brain trudges away through Margaret's question. Taking a life without permission is a great evil, and I can't imagine any justification that makes it not so. It's just too much of a certainty. And yet, I feel sympathy for Margaret's theoretical murder. I feel like I can understand how they reached their conclusion. Even if I'm unable to imagine the type of person capable of killing another, good intentions or otherwise. Killing another with good intentions? What am I even talking about? I feel tempted to simply reply that they are evil, but I can't shake the feeling of that being the wrong answer. Instead, I allow my feelings to override my logic, and I give an answer which horrifies me. I feel sorry for them. Oh? And why is that? I feel like taking a life is evil, but if a person did it anyway to stop someone from suffering, then they must have cared a lot for that person. Cared about them more than right or wrong. Cared enough about them to become evil. For some reason, I feel on the verge of crying. Why is this so sad to me? Why am I sad at myself for thinking this way? I'm so confused. A very interesting answer, young lady. Very interesting indeed. I'm surprised. Margaret's boisterous attitude brings me back from my melancholy. You're surprised? Yes. You abandon your black and white certainties for a very nuanced perspective. Thank you, Winter, for entertaining my strange questions. Please, don't worry about it anymore and be on your way. I have beyond mine as well. She stands up, and so I do the same. After exchanging goodbyes, I leave Margaret and continue on my way back to the dorm, feeling somewhat morose. So, right there, they could have further complicated the whole issue about the person needing medicine that's not easy to obtain, stuff like that. It's scarce enough to where giving it to this person would actually hurt others, and so on, but I guess the game did not want to go that dark. When I return to my room, Waverly is sitting at her desk. Marcus' conversation has left me in a strange mood, and I don't so much find the courage to confront her about her treatment of me as I find the indifference. Do you dislike me, Waverly? I'm sorry, Winter? I just meant to keep a distance between us, but I'm pretty sure I've just been acting like a jerk. So, sorry. Huh? What do you mean? Why would you want to keep distance between us? It isn't because you don't like me? No, I just... I like you just fine, Winter, it's just that... She takes a breath. When I was younger, I went to a boarding school and had a roommate there. We got along really well, and... 
Most no exaggerations say that she became the person I cared about most in that place. But I did something that upset her during her final year, and then had to continue living with her. It was unpleasant to say the least. Every day hurt. Oh. Before I came here, I decided that I wouldn't let myself get into that situation again. I decided to keep my distance from whoever my roommate turned out to be. I don't dislike you, Winter. In fact, I do like you, and I would like to be your friend. I was just suppressing that feeling, because it hurt less than what I knew could happen. But the more I acted that way, the more I realized it was selfish. Cruel to you. It was obvious that it bothered you. So, I'm sorry, and I understand if you hate me for it. I... don't hate you at all, Waverly, but thank you for your apology. I never thought that you might have a reason like that. I'm sorry for making you talk about it. I'm glad I understand now. I can give you your space if that's what you want. It's okay. You don't have to. Just, please, don't hate me if I do something stupid. Yeah, I think I can probably handle that. Can't really see myself hating anyone, much less you. Watch out. I'll hold you to stuff like that. I chuckle. I jump onto my bed, feeling much better now that the mystery is solved. Maybe this mediation business won't be so bad after all. Upon my entrance to the nondescript shack, a man on his knees looks at me with a panicked glance. I think his name's Samuel. I swear, I've told you everything! Claude approaches me at my side. Good day, Margaret. To what do we owe the pleasure? You're still not done with him. Well, we believe he has yet more to say. He turns to the man. But by God, he's stubborn. We're running out things to break and cut on him. The discipline of the King's army is something else. You know, Samuel, if he would just oblige us, we would return the kindness and end it for you quickly. I, I don't know anything more. Please believe me. Relax, Samuel. I believe you. What the hell were you thinking? He paces frantically around me as I lean against a nearby wall. Ignoring him, I reach into my pocket and draw out a cigarette. Light it for me. You think I'm about to do anything for you? Please. He swears under his breath, but nevertheless rifles through his pockets and then strikes a match. He moves to me and gets started. You best start talking. This is going to be on my head, you know. You were going to kill him anyway. Yes, when we were done with him. Who knows what information we missed out on now. He throws his hands into the air. He told us everything. According to him, you don't know that. I do, actually. Claude pauses at this. You couldn't possibly... I knew everything he had to say before you even picked him up. He crosses his arms. Is that so? Then why do we go through all that trouble? Would you have believed any of it had it come from me? The man grumbles to himself. Well, how did you know it, then? I have my sources. Oh, how trustworthy that sounds, Margaret. You are already on thin ice, you know. I changed the subject. Have you heard of the trolley problem? Are you philosophizing again? Is now really the time? Isn't it always, Claude? For a man in an organization so concerned with ideology, you don't see much for new ideas. Well, what is it then? Pretend you were a train engineer at a junction in the tracks. There's a lever to change which track the train will proceed along. You know for certain that if the train follows its current path, it will kill five people. But if you pull the lever, it will only kill one. So, do you pull the lever? Claude pauses. Is this some sort of trick? Clearly you would pull the lever and save the five lives over the one. There is no trick. That is the correct answer in the simplest case. But the thing to consider is that by being aware of the situation, by being in a position to act, you are now responsible for the death of either the five or the one. My concern, Claude. 
is that you are continuously placing me in situations where I must make these decisions. You are coating my hands in blood. I do not like blood on my hands, Claude. And by the end of this, for your sake, I hope the numbers will tally well. To my annoyance, Claude chuckles at my warning. You, the kind of Saul, the kindest of us all, are threatening me. Pardon if I don't take it too seriously. My frown deepens. I feel it is important, Claude, that you realize that those who dislike violence and cruelty are just as capable of it, provided they have sufficient motivation. He snuffs at this, but I know well enough to sense his acceptance. Enough of this. There's more for us to do tonight. To lay out a sign, appreciate the cool air on my skin before turning toward our next destination. Yes. Let's get on with it. When our work is done, we go our separate ways. After a short distance, I pause to reflect before shifting back to my home plane. I recall a girl whom I so recently became acquainted with, and will likely mentor in due time. She may not see it herself, but I can sense great potential in her. She is a rare blend of doubt, of strong morals, of quick understanding, and of deep care for others. She will either go on to do great things, or this profession will quickly break her and toss her aside. Despite my experience, I have little idea what she will be. I take a breath of the chilled evening air. Sometimes I feel it is rather cruel what we put these children through, but there is little choice in the matter. There must always be someone who pays for the comfort of others, and these young peoples have drawn the short straw. I can feel myself becoming distressed at these thoughts, and so I toss them aside as I have learned to do. There is no sense in worrying about what is beyond our control, after all. I simply must do what I can, and so must they. And that concludes the prologue. Thank you for playing, see you next episode if it ever does materialize. So in case you're wondering, in the first episode, Winter's mentor is Cyrus, who is... Like, I don't know if you want to call him the ad like an advocate of gunboat diplomacy or something, but he is... He's trigger-happy, I'll leave it at that. If I ever um, get around to recording the first chapter, it's very, very low priority. It actually does have multiple endings, one of which where Cyrus sets into motion events that destroy the world he's trying to mediate. So just be aware that he is like that. What I'm also kind of curious about is whether or not there was actually a canon ending, because I don't remember that, because the second game has to, well, the second chapter has to pick up somewhere. And I don't know if they're going to go with Cyrus pretty much obliterating that world or what exactly. I don't know if Margaret is being set up to be the antagonist of the series, or what exactly, but... Like I said in the very beginning, I don't know if they're, they being the devs, are actually going to follow through with producing the second chapter or not. Their Kickstarter gave them the funding, but they didn't use it properly or something. I'm not entirely sure what the exact story is. And basically they just ran out of money and developed out I guess appease the backers and maybe scrounge up some funds, I'm not entirely sure. So if the second game ever materializes and more information is revealed, I may come back and record the first game, but if nothing else, this may serve as a reminder that Dysfunctional Systems was once here.